The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode 18 of season two of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have a jam-packed episode, so I'm going to be short up front, but I want to make sure to, well, first of all, thank you all for your patience. I know this every other week schedule is not ideal for me, uh, but this is an extra long episode, so maybe you can just spread it out. But we are, um, you know, I'm just working on a lot of different projects. I'm going to get back to weekly, maybe even more than once a week. That's kind of in the back of my mind for season three is to kind of blow this format out into instead of having segments in each episode, maybe make a different episode three times a week. One that's gear related, one that's an interview, one that's more of a lesson oriented stuff. That's all still the wheels turning in the back of my mind, but just putting the final final touches on a master class that we're going to be announcing soon it's in partnership with hawthorne drum shop we got one of my favorite drummers we're about 85 90 percent sure that's going to be confirmed uh, we're going to be bringing them in here to pittsburgh and do it to our master class we'll make that actual announcement probably in the next episode once everything is completely uh, locked in but in the meantime um that's our intro beat there from david austin thank you so much for sending that intro beat uh, before we get into what he's doing, if you want to get your intro beats onto the show, just email them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. Include a description of what you're playing. If you want to submit it as a video format, that'd be awesome. We'll drop it into the video of the show. But here's what David said about his beat. He says, I recorded this on my Tama Walnut Birch Kit, but wasn't liking the big sound of the 22-inch kick, so I swapped it for an 18-inch Tama Superstar with no hole or muffling. The snare is a dampened acrylite and the cymbals are all minor. I used the Focusrite Claret 8 Pre and ran it into Logic on my MacBook. SM57 on the snare, Crown CM700 on the hats, Beta 56 on the toms, Beta 52 on the floor, Sennheiser E602 and Yamaha Subkick on the bass drum, and AKG 214s for overheads. This was created with Apple Loops in the Logic Pro library. It was my first experiment when I got the new rig up and running, and I've been listening to Richard Spaven, so that was my inspiration. Well, thank you, David. That sounds amazing. Once again, get your beats onto the show. E them over, e email them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. So let's get to, wow, let's get to our main topic. So two episodes ago, I compared a piccolo birch snare and a 55 by 14 birch snare. To kind of see what does the depth of the shell do to the sound at a shallower, you know, depth. So the piccolo, which was a four, I believe, or maybe I think it was a four by 14 and a five and a half by 14, both with birch plywood shells. This time I have two maple drums. They're both plywood. One is a five and a half by 14, eight ply, I believe, with some re-rings. That's the Bucks County maple that um, I got made for my little micro bop kit. So it has like an orange glass lacquer finish. And then... We're going to go super deep. I have an 8 by 14 pork pie all maple that's wrapped in a like a gold glass um, wrap. I've had that drum for many, many years, and I've never really compared it to any other drum. I use it for one certain thing, which is the super low dead kind of cigar roast sound. That's when I pull that drum out of, out of the cases. But for this comparison, I tuned both drums identically across the entire tuning range. So I took the... And the bottom head would stay the same at all times. It was F sharp, I think third octave, which is pretty high, but not like super, super high, but pretty high. And it stayed there. And then what I did was I tuned the top head up tight until I got a fundamental note of G sharp. And that was my like very tight tuning. Identical on both drums, played the same beat. And then I would just tune it down a half step. So it went down from uh, G sharp to G, F sharp, F. I don't know how far down I went. I don't remember. We'll see in the demo when we watch it here. But I took it down basically until the head started to disengage from the shell and it wasn't really doing anything. Um, just to compare, you know, what does a medium depth drum sound like, feel like? How does it respond to different tunings compared to a super deep 8x14? Um, 
So let's take a listen. The results were really kind of shocking. So uh, let's just watch. So what I got here is a quick cut. You're going to get, you know, the 5x14 for two measures jumping to the 8x14 for two bars. It's going to go back and forth like that all the way down the tuning range. Uh, pretty interesting results. Let's take a listen. Now that is not at all what I expected. So it, the same thing happened with the shallow drums where the the deeper drum actually had a higher perceived pitch, but I can I can assure you that these drums were tuned to the exact same frequency. Like the heads were tuned to the exact same frequencies. Whatever happens from what you hear is what the shell is actually doing. So the deeper drum, if my ears are correct, sounded higher at each tuning. Um, in this whole other world of things, the five and a half just seemed a little bit more comfortable everywhere to me and just had a bit more like character and personality. The 8x14 just, I mean, it sounded really cool, like maybe two notches down from the very high. I felt like that was where the shell started to kind of play a part in it. And then it sounds nice, super low, but everything in the middle, um, I don't know that I would go to that drum for that sound. It definitely felt different. It doesn't translate to the microphones, obviously. It felt like I could really play the 8x14 a lot louder. Um, when I did a full demo of both of these, I alternated between like playing really hard rim shots and then just dead center at each tuning. And the, yeah, the 8x14, there was like no ceiling. I couldn't hit it hard enough for it to kind of choke out. Whereas the 5.5, there's there a spot where you, you really shouldn't hit it much harder than that. You could still smack it, but it wasn't... Um, it wasn't giving me anything more once I got to a certain point. It kind of has a sweet spot where you hit a nice strong rim shot and the whole drum resonates. But with that 8x14, I think I could have been swinging from the fences and it still would have responded well. That's a big difference that didn't really translate, I don't think, to the microphones. There's probably also something else happening because that bottom mic has to be so much further away. Um, so you're just not getting... I mean, I put a mic on the side of the show. I don't know. I'm really confused by why it sounds so, so different. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's an interesting experiment. I'm kind of baffled by it. I still think the 5.5 sounds better. I mean, really, for all intents and purposes, I would go to that drum for more often. Um, if I was playing really hard, I'd go for the 8 by 14 If I wanted that really deep, low thing, which would have been a few more tunings below where we stopped... That's where the the eight by fourteen maple it really kind of excels. Throw like a, a like a handkerchief or something over part of the head, and it just sounds like an old colonial drum or something. Um, what else did I notice? What else did you notice? Um, I'm very curious what you think. Um, the the deeper drum again, in order to get that higher fundamental note out of it, I feel like I had to put more tension on the head for whatever reason. Um, the snares obviously responded well but you know there was just a little bit more um a bit more wetness i guess there was just like a little bit more of a delay of milliseconds of delay between when i hit the drum and when the the snares fully reacted uh, but kind of negligible but i think you can notice it um, if you're really comparing it like this um, otherwise you know it had just good response it wasn't like a, a slow responding drum um, yeah, so that is 5.5 by 14 maple versus 8 by 14 maple. Um, I don't think they could be any more different unless one of them was metal, which was kind of surprising. So, yeah, let me know what you hear, what you think of that. I'm going to keep doing these experiments. I've got some metal drums here. I'm going to do, I just 
I just re remodeled a like a, a, a 80s or maybe 90s Black Beauty 5x14. I have a 5x14 like old nickel over brass six lug and I have a 4x14 two piece um, nickel over brass. So I'm going to do like a different versions of the Black Beauty or the Ludwig brass. That's going to be another thing we're going to do. Um, I have a bunch of metal drums in different depths. I might try that again. So we're going to wrap it up this segment. I, a couple years ago, I did um, Sugar Percussion sent me like, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I think it was six or seven drums. We'll see here in the video. All made from the same tree, the same mahogany. They're all stave shell made from the same tree of mahogany at different depths. So two by 14, four by 14, six, eight, 10, 12. Maybe there's a 14 by 14. Uh, and I tuned again, tuned them absolutely identically and played the exact same thing in quick cut. So this, this you'll hear like what was, if the drum was as, as identical as it ever possibly be, could be, just changing the depth, um, here's what happens with that. So check this out. Yeah, so that was six drums, two, four, six, eight, 10, and 12 by 14. Uh, something I forgot to mention that I definitely noticed in my more recent comparison, and you can really hear it there. The length of the sustain between the shallower and the deeper drums was very noticeable. The deeper drums, the sustain just kind of could sing on for a measure or two if you didn't dampen the drum at all. Like that eight by 14, once I started playing, I feel like it just never stopped. It just kept kind of singing. Whereas the five and a half, it kind of had a, a nice decay, like a round decay. It was a bit of a gap between back beats. So that's another thing to consider. The deeper drum is going to just have more sound to deal with. If that's an issue for you, um, dampen it up or use a shallower drum. So that's it. Let's get to our featured interview. All right, this week I'm interviewing the great percussionist band leader, composer, Mike Dillon. Mike, I first became aware of him when he, in his collaboration with Matt Chamberlain in the project Critters Buggin. He's also been involved in uh, Garage a Trois. He, is, he plays with Les Claypool's trio. Um, most recently, they played, I believe, his New Year's gigs with Vinnie Cayuta on drums. And he has his own band, Punkadelic, which is a trio with himself, Nikki Glassby on drums and Brian Haas on keys and synths. And it's really, the new record is absolutely fantastic. So definitely go check out that record. They're on the road now supporting it. Um, it's one of the best records I've heard this year for sure. They're killing. Nikki sounds great. Mike sounds great. They all sound great. It sounds like a band. Um, it's just three people just killing it. So this is a fun one. We caught up with Mike, uh, I believe the day before he left for tour in his space. So he's got all of his instruments around. Um, so yeah, let's check it out. Mike Dillon. So where are you? What is this room that you're in? It looks amazing. This is my wife's art house, art studio, where I keep my instruments in Kansas City when I'm up here. Uh, uh, sweet. Yeah, it's where I do a lot of music. I go between here and New Orleans. So uh, yeah, I'm up here for another four days. Well, we start a tour tomorrow in the Midwest, and I go back to New Orleans. So how'd you end up in Kansas city? My wife. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, it's like a good central spot, right? For touring. Yeah, it is pretty great. Like I have a history here. Uh, I lived here basically until 98. And then I moved back to Texas where I'm from. And then I moved to new Orleans in 2006. And then in 2018, Peregrine and I started hanging out up here. So that's when, I just started going back and forth doing the, I have an apartment in New Orleans and we have this place here. So nice. Yeah. She's got her business and she's a visual artist. So she's got a big art studio here too. So it's sort of, this works best this way. Yeah. I mean, it's a killer space. You got everything there. Yeah. I got my Deegan vibraphone. I got an old Deegan marimba. I got my majestic vibraphone that I tour with. Got my Malacat rig and 
with a Prophet Six, got a little vinyl rumba, timpani. I even got a bass marimba, you know, piano, drums, smoke, gombok congas. So I do a lot of recording up here. This is where I've been writing everything and recording. Got a great studio I work at. And uh, so it's sort of like write and record up here in Kansas City and then play gigs and tour everywhere else. I do play some gigs here, but it's not like when you're in New Orleans, there's just so many gigs and so many musicians down there. You're always, always playing. Mm. Seems like sometimes two, three gigs a day down there. Oh, no kidding. Really, really fun. So how long do you spend down there versus in Kansas City? I do it really seasonal. Like I, I'm, I'm going to be heading down there usually at least a week, a month down there. And like, but I'll go like two months without being here at all. You know, like do the whole fall down in New Orleans and base myself there and tour out of New Orleans. And I'm about to go down to New Orleans for the next couple of months and tour being based out of there, probably all the way up until jazz fest until the middle of summer. Mm. And then when it gets really hot down there, then I come back up here and hide. Ah, smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> New Orleans is brutal during the summer. Yeah, I've only been there in the fall and the winter, and it was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's so many great musicians. I heard you had Brian Blade recently. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we podcast. talked about Brian, and I had uh, Matt Chamberlain on a long time ago. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of people you've collaborated with. Um, yeah, I haven't Matt. had Stanton on yet. I, I've got to get Stanton on. That should be on the list. Yeah, get Stanton on. He's great. Old JP Stanton. Gaster, he was on. So, yeah, it's, we've oh, kind yeah, of been John circling Paul. around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Wow. And I, actually, I tried to reach out to Nikki, but I didn't hear back from her. So, I'm going to try again. Yeah, sh- I'll, I'll make her, I'll tell her to hit you back. She's, Nikki's been on fire lately. I mean, she sounds so good on the record. It's unbelievable. Yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, happy for that trio we have yeah i have so can many I things sit down to ask am I you moving about. around too much you can do whatever you want man it's kind of cool to see the space so whatever you're feeling man <laughs> put some light on so you can see a little better but uh so cool. do you have you mentioned you're running do you have like a daily morning routine that you stick to yeah, I try. I run every day. I mean, every other day, so the bones, the old bones, can heal. Mm-hmm. And and I practice tabla in the morning. Mm. And I have my when I'm around my vibes, I have my vibraphone ritual I do. I just completed, and you know, the tabla I practice really extensively because you know I still have my teacher, a Dutta, that I meet with every other week on Facetime. Mm. You know, just this and i used to fly to la once a month but when the pandemic started we started doing the zoom lessons you know and it it's really been great being able to stay focused on the tabla every other week Mm -hmm. it's it's like being in college it's just like tons of assignments and you just no matter how proficient you think you're getting you know you have to dig deeper on it and then all of a sudden, three years later, a loc will be like, listen to yourself. Do you hear the progress you're making? Mm. So, and, and that's really what I like about studying in general is it, it keeps us in the process and it keeps, no matter what gig level you're at or your career level, I mean, we're all students of the drums, no matter what level you're at. You know, it, to me, I mean, Coltrane was taking lessons with, with uh, Ornette Coleman. Mm-hmm. right right <laughs> okay, you know like there's always something to learn so and vibes I, I i practice it constantly too you know i mean i i love practicing like charlie parker songs and monk tunes like those like finding bebop songs that i love and learning mm-hmm. those songs but i wouldn't consider myself a, a bebop player i just i like like it from my vocabulary so I can bring it into my world, you know, and I, you know, also like learning like lots of Elliot Smith songs because those translate well to instrumental right before I got on with you, I show my pianist the song can't make a sound. 
that was on the figure eight record that I covered on my Rosewood record, did an instrumental version of it. You know, we also do like Nine Inch Nails Hurt, we do John, Johnny Cash's version. So finding songs like that just to, to learn when I'm hanging out at home. And then sometimes I start playing them live. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I love playing monk songs live. I mean, they're just so much, you know, some of these, it, you know, it's all about the song, really. Yeah, Whether yeah. it's monk or Elliot Smith song, they're great songs that you can play instrumentally or, you know, if there's vocals to them, a, a vocalist can sing them. But I don't know. That's sort of like my practice routine. But running is a big part of it. Mm-hmm. And, and trying to do some meditation and breathing because I, I find that, that just all that stuff helps with the on the gig you know because like like say 30 years ago when we first started touring and we'd have to like go do a showcase for like back in the days when there were major labels and you you would go and like all right we got to play really good because we're gonna get a record deal and be big or whatever that that was sort of the thinking because we didn't know better but if I was teaching my younger self, I'd say, don't worry about that. Go to the corner, do some deep breathing for 15 minutes, center yourself, and just go play the music. And whatever happens, happens. You know, you know to quote Aleister Crowley, he used to say, don't lust after results. Mm. Which, you know, it's the same thing as the power of now. Like, just stay in the moment. Stay in the now. And don't think about all the extracurricular stuff because at the end of the day, the music is all we got. Mm -hmm. So I do things like that as part of my daily ritual. Does that stick when you're on the road? You know, we got to practice because this isn't like just something we can just like, I mean, there's such a physical nature to it. Like that's another reason why I work out to stay in shape at 57 for the gig, to be Mm -hmm. able to play two hours straight and not have my body hurting or falling apart. I mean, I see these videos of Tommy Otterich playing. It's ridiculous. Mm. And I was talking to one of my buddies who was drum teching for him on a tour. And he said he like jogs or bikes 20 miles a day, like this crazy workout regimen. You're like, okay, you see the guys that work out, they're still playing great. And then the guys that don't work out, maybe they're playing great, but you know, I mean, it's just, it's life. Like our bodies fall apart. So, at a certain age, you start fighting gravity. Mm, yeah, I'm there. <laughs> I'm right there now. <laughs> yeah. So how do you uh, how do you stick to that when you're on the road so much? There's not a whole lot of days off in your your calendar. It doesn't look like that. Sometimes suffers, but even if it's just 20 minutes, get out. And if you're like some crummy area where your hotel is, just go run and try not to get run over by a car. Just you know get a little bit and then that's another great reason i love playing tabla is because i can take those into my hotel room and get 30 minutes mm. of just and, and like you know uh, uh one tabla composition there's different names for them but you can just play the main theme of the kaidas or the raylas you can just play those really slow just like you would play rudiments you know and just focus on that one little bit and, and get into that. And it can really keep your hands nice and loose. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, it's very meditative, you know, going da 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 it's like you slow it down and you play it for a long time your arms start hurting because Uh you're playing so slow we all want to play fast but play it slow and then like so the tabla is a really great way to be able to practice on the road Mm. what is the um the influence of tabla on your composition i'm always curious about that because it doesn't directly correlate with like traditional jazz composition or whatever like a a lot of stuff like there's different songs i could pick out on different records whether like there's this garage song called computer crimes 
where we were doing a piece in five. And I was that? No, that's, not, no, that's a seven. So we were doing a seven thing, roof tile. Is roof tile seven? I think so. And job tiles, I, I'm horrible with memory, but there's job tile and roof tile. But so even if the tune's in four, a lot of times the phrasing and the melody, because the tabla system of, of like the way the all the variations within a composition, you know, like you'll have this, like, like in this one piece I've been doing called Unemployed by a little low road is I'm thinking that other one. Uh, I'd have to, let me, uh, I'm choking on, online. I'm, I'm folding right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's early. I get it. <laughs> got it right here. I'm thinking another one, but, um, like those are all like within the four four you heard the different phrases of fives and there were some threes so, like, I find that having studied tabla, that that stuff just automatically comes out in my vibraphone playing. And a lot with my composer, whether I'm right here on the piano or over on the vibes, like like on that song, Inflorescence, on the new record. Like, to me, that sounds like, that's like a real tabla kind of line. Mm. It's a long phrase within a slow four and that's the other thing about like like you know there's nine eight and then there's nine four you know with tabla and then also within the nine four you have four and a half mm. you know four and a half plus four and a half is nine so that would be phrase like and and we I've done a lot of writing like that over the years, like where you you know, even like metal stuff like one, two, three, a long 11, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, you know, because you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, because eight plus three is 11. Mm. Like, like long 11, it's like a lot of metal riffs that I've written for like Dead Kenny G's and with Punkadelic is, is definitely just directly influenced by tabla phrasing. Because, you know, like like my first introductions to Odd Times was growing up in the original wave of fusion. How old are you? 44 in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so I'm 57. So, like, I was, you know, in junior high when Rush and King Crimson and Mahavishnu and listening to Billy Cobham and Neil Peart and all those guys play Odd Times. It was just, like, such a mystery to me and then like getting in new symphony and playing Stravinsky and then becoming less and less of a mystery. And then eventually studying tabla is just, everything is combinations of twos and threes, just like all our drum teachers have told us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, instead of our being da, 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 or like, you know, the way take five was um, articulated and phrased, started learning these long patterns of odd times, whether it's 11, four, nine, four, you know, and then breaking those up. Like there's four and a half or there's five and a half. And I remember the first lesson with the look that he said, this piece is in five and a half. I go five and a half, you know, Oh, five and a half is five and a half is 11. And he goes, well, if you're driving to the store and it's five and a half miles, it's five and a half, right? And I go, yeah. He goes, so it's five and a half. It's not 11. 
is five and a half. Interesting. <laughs> so like that was sort of mind blowing. So, and that's the thing about Indian music. It's, it's a, it's a cycle, you know, like it, it, cause the first half is the male and then the bottom half, the bottom 90 is the female. And then it returns back to the male to come back into the top cycle. So yeah, the piece is an 11, but it's two five and a half mm. that compose the 11. And then you really start articulating and, and all your improvis improvisations or variations, I should say, or as long as you keep the roadmap of the five and a half solid in your counting, then it, it really is a lot easier to play and articulate and make it sound like music. So I don't know. It just seems like the lifelong quest because I wasn't born. I mean, my mom played piano. My grandmother played piano in church and whatnot, and band. But it wasn't like I was in a family of full-time musicians and I was constantly been, being inundated with, with the heaviest cats on the planet you know like of course i knew who buddy rich was and my mom had good big played big band music and i was able to hear jazz but i didn't say have like a, a dad who was a musician breaking it all down to me my dad mm. was a football coach you know mm. so i heard more about like son you need to re run a 40 yard dash a lot faster <laughs> if you're gonna play pro football and you're pretty slow so maybe you should stick with them drums son you know <laughs> That's what my dad said to me. Hey, good advice, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, you kind of alluded a little bit to the composing. I wanted to ask you about your your process. How do you compose? And then more importantly, because this is something I struggle with, how do you take an idea or an inspiration to fruition to make a complete song? Yeah, that to me is the funnest part and why I think playing a mallet instrument as a drummer is so crucial. Like, even if you don't play your mallet instrument live, I mean, when I was in bands getting right out of North Texas and, and playing in bands there, the, the guy in the band that was the songwriter always was like, wow, how'd you do that, man? You know, and I'd want to go hang out with him. And I'd be, he'd be like, come over, let's write a song together. And I, you know, I had my vibes because I played Malice and I was in the pit and drum line and whatnot. I floundered on it at, in jazz school. So I just started doing it. And to me, part of my process was I'd be come up with one little motif or whatever that, that I liked. And I'd be like, okay, that sounds pretty cool. Now let, I would just sit there and tinker with it for hours mm -hmm. until it started sounding cool. Like, you know, whether it was like, Ooh, that sort of reminds me of like, you know, in the late eighties, that was when I first started writing songs. So things were a lot of times I was trying to sound like Curtis Mayfield meets the Beastie boys or whatever, mm. just in my head, compositionally, like what I was going for. And they were real simple ideas, but I usually thought they sucked. And um, and then I got in a band where I was writing lyrics, but we I had a really good bass player and a guitar player that were both the main like songwriters. So every now and then I would be like, hey, I got this little riff thing I think is pretty cool. And they'd be like, oh, that's cool. And, and then they would put a B part to it or whatever. I'd be like, awesome. And I remember the day I wrote my first song that they liked and it was like, you know, and that was sort of how it was back in the day. You're taking an idea, and usually as the drummer, most drummers can relate to this, the drummer's in the band, especially if you're in a band that's got some success, you bring in a song when you're writing for the new record, and they just look at you like, oh, you're the drummer. You're not allowed to write for us. At least that was my experience back in the day. There was this sort of this like, oh, you got a song, huh? Let's hear it. But... um Luckily, I was with guys that were pretty, uh, they would encourage me to keep going for it. And they would tell you, but so this song I had called I'm Your Manager, I'm Your Pimp, it just had like a really stupid riff. 
and a B section. And they're like, wow, that's sort of cool. And we started doing it, you know. And then along the way with Billy Goat, and that, that was the band I had in the early 90s. With Chamberlain was Matt Chamberlain was the first drummer in that band. Every now and then I'd write a song, but as we got towards the end of that band, I started to bring the vibes in. And for that last record, I probably wrote two or three songs on the vibes. And by that point, I was really practicing Thelonious Monk songs a lot. And, and, and my ear was horrible. Because I think that's the other part of it. As a classically trained percussionist and rudimentally, you know, drumline guy, the, the ear training part of being a drummer wasn't stressed enough. I'm sure now it is to all young percussionists. But it was mainly just like, if it wasn't written, I had no idea how to like, what do you mean? I got to learn it by ear? And sax players, the different people I was working with, they're like, yeah, bro, learn that shit by ear. So, I, you know, I'd start going to jazz jams and like trying to play, a, getting lost on B-flat blues. And then I was just like, okay, I got to get my ear together. And then you, you start doing all the things to figure out how like if you're playing a song for my father, you're not going, okay. You know, F minor, counting the number of bars, you start hearing the changes. So, and, and, it, and it became that way with the songwriting. Eventually, I started hearing where I wanted it to go. And there was always a part of me in my writing that I just wanted it to be different than and weird. So being a percussionist and writing on the vibes or a keyboard because I'd fumble around the piano. It was easy to start writing weird music. Mm. And there were no rules in any of the bands I was playing with at the time. And I would say right after Billy Goat broke up, we started this group called the Harry Apes Butt Moving Experience. I just moved out to Seattle to play in Critters Buggin'. And I was in the rehearsal space that Critters had, you know, Chamberlain had all his shit there, Brad Hauser. And there was a four track that Chamberlain had there. And I wrote seven songs. Like, like that was it, like completed seven songs and sent out the tape. And it was all stuff, just little ideas that I came up, you know, I put a drum machine groove down or record a drum set groove and then play a vibes part that I thought and come up with an A and a B section and then a bridge. And, and I would just search until I'd be like, all right. And that was for the, that was the first group that I ever made, like, you know, a complete demo of songs and sent it to some of the guys I'd been in Billy Goat with and a couple of the awesome musicians and everyone heard it. And they're like, wow, these are cool. And the band formed as a result of that initial seven songs that I wrote. And that was when I started getting a little bit of confidence as a songwriter. And then especially when people started coming to the shows and dancing, and it was like, wow, people like the songs. And then I just got obsessed with it. And, I, and, and that's like whenever I get time off from the road, I just immediately just want to go write mm -hmm. and get it out of me. And so it took me a minute to get to how the process started because it started at being completely bewildered and terrified, but really wanting to do it and not understanding to just do it, get through it. You know, nowadays everyone has GarageBand on their computers, you know, and then that was the next thing. I just like before GarageBand, I had Matt's old uh, Akai four track recorder. I just started writing songs on that all the time, cassette, four track. And then I moved up to a digital one on Roland. And it just, whenever I got off from tour, I would write you know, record the vibes, the drums, use a keyboard to play the bass parts. And, and if something was good and stuck out, and for me, a lot of it was just something that stayed in my head. I was like, all right, that's catchy. That's cool. Hmm. And, um, you know, and, and along the way, it's just like, I just realized like, shit, I've written a lot of songs. I got a lot of records, you know, for Garage Etoile. I was really excited when those guys played some of my songs. And, um, uh, Dead Kenny G's, the Malachi Papers. And then, like, after all that, for the Go Go Jungle, it was like, all right, finally, I'm going to be in a band where I, the vibes is the only melodic instrument 
and I'm the songwriter and I'm even the singer, which is, you know, I have my own style of singing. Um, it's not for everyone, but the people that like it, like it, I like it. And that's, what's important. I think at the end of the day, you just got to like what you do mm. and, and challenge yourself, you know, cause I'd always had like a Rhodes player or a guitar player in the band. So being like when the go, go jungle started with my friend, go, go Ray, I was like, all right, I got pedals. I got effects. The vibes is going to carry the band. And that was another part of the concept of like lead vibraphone. You know, I'd got to jam with Tito Puente at college and, you know, the T Tito was the leader of his band. It was really inspiring. I was just like, I started thinking along the way, why do the percussionists have to be the back seat? Like, I don't mind being the back seat. I love supporting great artists, but I mean, what's, why can't, a vibraphone or a xylophone be the lead instrument in a band? Why does it always have to be guitar or piano, you know? Mm -hmm. So that became another part of what I was seeking and what I was trying to develop as a musician and a composer. So what about the, the current trio um, with Nikki and Brian? Was the writing any differently? Was it more collaborative? That's what was exciting about this record. It was finally like year after years of uh, going from collabor collaborative writing. Then I'll send it for a long time. It was just like, I was like the selfish bastard. You can be in the band, but I'm writing everything. La, la, la. I'm doing all the writing. Like I had to prove it to myself. To so this record being like, hey, Brian, I love your songs. Jacob Fred Jazz Odyssey was amazing. Uh, why don't you write two or three songs? Uh, I'll write a couple of new ones. We got a couple of my old ones we reworked that I wrote during the pandemic. Go away, phone. Send a voicemail. Sorry. <laughs> Did that pause us, hopefully? It's all um, good. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and, and for this record, yeah, we collaborated. It was really fun to, to be in a band because Dead Kenny G's, I collaborated with Skerrick and Critters Bug, and we all collaborated. And same thing with with uh, the the hairy apes, you know. It's and and Billy Go, you know. I had my songwriting partner, so like I, I feel now with Brian Haas and with Nikki because she's a great drummer who can like you hear on the new record. She's the only person singing on it. She mm -hmm. sound she sounds like an opera singer. Um, so it, it's amazing to, for this group, for me to like sort of let down the like, I have to be the songwriter to be like, all right, three brains are better than one. Three hearts are better than one. Let's all write music together. How did you do that? Did you get some rehearsal time in? I mean, what is the, what was the writing process? Um, for this one, the writing process was, hey, Brian, write some instrumental music that doesn't sound like avant-garde <laughs> jazz weirdo why don't you write something that sounds more like a queens of the stone age song uh. and, and and just like sort of giving him that i'm like let's do a rock instrumental record and of course our our love of jazz is going to come through um but it was it was like let's just try to make a concise instrumental music that maybe someone that's that thinks jazz is dumb or hates like instrumental music could go, oh wow, this is cool. And and also for me, I, I like playing, you know, like I like playing Elliot Smith songs instrumentally. And those mm -hmm. are great pop songs. And, and what's cool about doing like pop instrumental or rock instrumental is you're not hammering the head people over the head with your lyrical concept, which you know, we we all want to think we're Bob Dylan or Keats or or whoever, or Shakespeare, or William S. Burroughs, but, you know, really, we're not. We can try to be, and, and just like we're not Beethoven's or Bach's, but we can try to be, but at least with instrumental music, I think it gives the listener a little freedom to paint the picture they want to paint. Mm -hmm. So I did. that was the only rules for this record, okay. or suggestions, or no rules, but like, hey, Let's write some instrument uh, rock instrumentals for it. And Brian's version of rock is different than my version. And when he brought the songs in, we just rehearsed them on sound checks and, mm. and started playing them in, in gigs. 
and a couple of them like inflorescent that song i actually wrote when i heard that taylor hawkins had passed you know mm. and at first i you know because a lot of times my songwriting comes out of like an emotional like whatever and, and that's not unique a lot of people do um i remember when my dad died i just w- walked right to my vibes and wrote a song and we recorded it with Noah Ted. and um so inflorescence was originally called th and it was sort of a tribute to taylor and then we just started calling it inflorescence because that the whole that that word about to bloom and um I, I really started thinking about that word as a concept. So I felt like we talked about that word and, and just having the, those simple structures. And we actually just went to the studio. I think every song we had rehearsed a little bit in sound check, a couple of them we had played live, but we pretty much did three takes and recorded everything in the afternoon. Mm. But it was definitely the result of touring for a year and a half mm-hmm. together. And Brian and I have been playing together for 22 years now, maybe 23. So we've been playing together off and on for a long time. And, um, you know, Nikki, I've known her for a while now, but the pandemic was the reason we all came together because she was out playing. She lived in Austin and we were going, you know, playing gigs around here. Like in Kansas City, you played in people's porches and, front yards you know because folks wanted to hear music and in new orleans there were little outdoor venues that popped up so nikki would come over to new orleans from austin and we did a couple of gigs together and i was like wow this thing's really sort of cool and we did a festival together outside of austin out in the country and those two they would just improvise and make stuff up that was so compositionally wonderful that sometimes it, we would start off with one of my songs. We do the song. If it was a song with vocals, I'd do my little vocal thing. And then those guys would just, you know, go into some rhythmic modulation and take the song to outer space. And that sort of became the concept for it. Like, all right, the songs start here. And then Brian and Nikki, when I'm done soloing or whatever, then I would just let them be a duo because they had such a strong concept as a duo, rhythmically mm. and harmonically, harmonically, that to me it was really satisfying. So after about one or two tours, I said to them, we have to make a record and let's do an instrumental record first. Mm. So now so, we're going to start working on a rock record together. That's going to be the challenge. Oh, with, vo- the, with vocals? Like, with vocals. Mm. And what the heck is a rock record in this day and age? <laughs> well, yeah, you don't have electric guitar. I think that's key defining thing. Yeah, you know, I got my vibes that I run through my Fender Super Reverb. And I get distortion there. But, I mean, a guitar is a guitar. So I'll probably end up bringing in a guitar for the <laughs> recording. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think these, I mean, you mentioned you did a couple tours, you made the record, obviously the songs must have evolved to a point where you want to document them. Where do you expect them to go from here now that you're going back out on the road? They're going to go somewhere when you don't have expectations. I mean, that that's one reason we love playing together. We take that mindset of like, we got to make it better every night. Mm. And that's one reason we all love touring so much because you just get a thing by being in the van together, loading your gear in and playing every night that the music gets better and better. And, and I imagine too, we'll come up with some new instrumentals and some new ideas that we'll end up using for the next record. But um, for me too, it's just such a great ass kicking. Like, you know, being pushed by Nikki and Brian every night, and I push them to co- just to come up with something new every night. Mm-hmm. So that's that's part of the ritual, and it, and it is a ritual. What just like waking up and practicing and running and doing all that is all designed to maybe find some magic. I mean, that's what we're all seeking is is some something really special and magical. You know, the other night, and I, I mentioned this to you in my email. You know. Just did a gig with 
with Les Claypool, Vinny Caliuta, and Skerrick. Right, right, yeah. And that was insane. You know, all we did was improvise every, you know, every song. There were no songs. I think <laughs> Les quoted Tommy the Cat for a second the first night. And he he played, like, quoted a few other songs. I'm going to get me one better. I think he quoted Glide. But, you know, the first rehearsal, or it wasn't a rehearsal, it was a jam. We just got together. Vinny walks in. You know, of course, I'm like, he's a drum superhero. Mm -hmm. I listen to Zappa all the time when I was a kid. So you're like, wow, I'm playing with the dude that, you know, Catholic girls and all that stuff. And um, and in three nights of playing together, it just kept getting better and better. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it's the communication on the bandstand. You're just listening, you're playing. And the way, like, Vinny's phrasing was so insane and so crazy. I mean, he... There were moments in time where Les started doing like some crazy bass stuff. And I look over and Vinny just started playing it with his feet. Like, and not like it was like, oh, he's playing the lick of what, you know, we all compared each other, but just like the musicality of how he was using double bass drum. I've never really even thought of Vinny as a double bass drummer, mm -hmm. you know, but. Obviously, he is, and it was insane. I mean, he was like saying he has to get a hip replacement, and he was doing like the craziest double bass drum shit <laughs> I had heard in a long time. I was like, wow, he's got the Dave Lombardo chops over there, you know? It was funny. really fun. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> How does, I mean, that's a like, that's a what, three days where you guys played and probably went your separate ways. I mean, when does something like that become an actual project? Like, does someone just have to say, hey, let's commit to this for six months or something? Well, uh, Les got on the microphone and said, he goes, so this is bastard jazz, more bastard than jazz. <laughs> and um, he goes, you know, I've just got through doing the Rush tour and I rehearsed for, you know, more than I ever have in my life. And you know what I love about this band is we don't rehearse. We're just up here throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. <laughs> and we did one tour this summer. So, I mean, I think with, with Les, you know, I call him the Colonel. I think the Colonel is one of those things where every now and then he'll do a two or three week tour with it. And we just get out and we just kick each other's ass. And, and at the end of it's two hours straight of improvisation. Some nights you feel like you play some great stuff. Other nights, you feel like, eh, you know, my ideas suck tonight or whatever. And that's the fun part of improvisation. But when you, you know, you just, most improv gigs are like some crazy creative music club or, you know, some little hole in the wall place where they're like, yeah, sure. We love guys to come in here and get weird. And there's like 20, 20 dudes with three of their girlfriends there that would have come hear this stuff. But when you're doing it with bastard jazz, there's always like a thousand people there or whatever. So that's the intense thing about that group is because usually on most improv gigs I do, like I said, you're like in these really just small rooms and your eyes are closed and, and you're just listening to each other and you're seeing what happens, but it's really fun and challenging when you're doing it with Les and Vinny to a sold out crowd in Napa at this 800 person room two nights in a row but you forget about the people being there and you're just listening to each other and you're like digging deeper and it's the same thing as what i was talking about with nikki and brian we did 10 we we did a 10 day tour with with stanton this summer stanton more on drums and every night it just got better the chops felt better and and, and i think for me, like those improv gigs, it's not all about just blowing all your chops and trying to sound like you're the fastest vibraphonist in the world. It really is about coming up with compositional ideas and writing songs on the spot. And, and that's the great thing about playing with Claypool. He's He improvises in a very musical, unique, singular fashion, which I think probably 
you know, half the time, you know, he probably just can go into the studio and just start playing some bass line and go, oh, that's cool. Hit record. And that's the beginning of a new song because he has just really creative ideas. So for that project, it always starts with that, with like less starting a bass line usually. Mm-hmm. And, and then like, all right, I have a melodic idea that sounds pretty cool on top of it. And you go with it for a minute, or maybe I will catch that thing he's doing over there. And that sounds cool too. So yeah, this it's a good challenge. Do you have any I mean you've worked with I'm looking at the track list of all the drummers that I could find, so many and so diverse for Matt Chamberlain, Stanton Moore, Johnny Vodakovich, Vinny, JP, Nikki, Earl Harvin, Allison Miller. Uh, advice for a drummer working with percussionists through you know, your experience over the years, what makes it really click for you? The first thing I learned a long time ago is to stay out of the drummer's way. That mm. was literally what my first percussion teacher, this guy who played congas in the one o'clock lab band. When I walked over to a conga and was able to hit it and get a slap, I was like, wow, this is good. There's, I like this. There's a lot of great drummers here in North Texas that are way better than me. But if I play percussion, maybe I can play with them. So I really liked hand drums and the fact that I could get a slap the first time I hit it, it, it felt natural. So I, from the get go, I was lucky because when I started getting into percussion, Matt was there at North Texas, as was Earl Harvin. So I started playing with those guys in bands. And it was always just find a way to compliment them. You know, I think the first conga song I ever really checked out was like, Ricky, don't lose that number. You know, you had the tumbao on there that Ralph McDonald played. I think that was he played percussion on that record. Pretty sure. Um, but um, I remember going, all right, I knew that I, I learned how to play the tumbao. So everything became just like different ways to creatively put like that conga part with it and okay if the song didn't need congas then be like all right i'm gonna try to put some cool shaker or bells or or tambourine but you know being the icing on the cake and and finding something musical that makes the song better and and try to be the glue Mm. but you know like when they're doing it like unless you work out the feel together I would always stay out of the way dur- during the drum fill. And then, like, I learned from Minu Sanulu, who played with Miles Davis, in case you don't know, like, the way he would answer, he would answer Al, Dave- Al Foster on those We Want Miles records. And, like, when I heard that record back in 84, that, 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 that's one of the greatest Black American music. That's what Nicholas, in case you don't know, a lot, of, you know, Nicholas Payton says it shouldn't be called jazz. It should be called black American music, just like Latin music, black American music. So to me, that was one of the greatest improv records I had ever heard at that point. I mean, there were songs, but just hearing the way they stretched out and hearing what Mino, Mino did on those records to my 18 year old percussionist brain. I really just got into that record. Then I got Miles, you know, at the you know, at the Fillmore, the records that you know, Bitches Brew that had an Ierto playing percussion. And I just started hearing the role between the percussionist and the drummer. And the best percussionists were the ones that stayed out of the hey Bowie! Bowie! <laughs> My dog's going crazy. Hey, can you calm down, Bowie? I'm doing an interview here. <laughs> so, you know, and then when I would play people, they would always say, wow, man, we, we really like what you add and you stay out of the way, you know, and drummers, you know, and then the other thing was just like locking in with them into their pockets. So that's, you know, my advice is less is more. And, and, you know, unless you work out a feel, don't play on the top of their feel, unless that's what y'all want, then that's fine too. But those are just the general rules I had when I first started playing, was just mm-hmm. compliment, the, be a compliment to the rhythm section. Because, you know, a lot of guys that I hear that are just, 
that maybe start off playing like nothing but like traditional because in 84 everyone wasn't going to cuba yet you know people you know white guys weren't learning all the bata drumming there was a few that were of course but you know like i'm sure bill bill summers and like the west coast he's there were guys but like like every percussionist on the block didn't have the opportunity to go to cuba and learn the oro seco and learn all the traditional parts that you play, whether it's in Roomba or Bata drumming or going to Africa and learning all those things. So I remember as I started learning Roomba parts like Wawan Co or Songo parts, I had wanted like, ooh, check out my new lick I learned and try to get it into the song of the band I was playing with. And sometimes it worked, like if, if the band was had a Latin song, like there was um, the song called Donde Es Mi Zapatos with, with Earl and uh, in Tin Hands. And, and we basically just played the songo that Frankie Malabe, when he came to North Texas, had showed the drummers and showed the percussionists. We made a whole song around it and it worked. But if I tried to put that songo pattern into a song that needed just a shaker or um, just a really simple conga par, or you know, you know, like the, like on those Al Green records, you know, it's just really listen and listen and listen. Like on Al Green records, there'll be conga parts so more felt than heard, you know. So that that that's the other part, and we all know it. Like back in 1984, you had to like go to the record store, buy a record to do some research. Now everyone can just turn on their phones and research all this music that I'm talking about mm-hmm. or that anyone talks about, and you can hear it instantly and reference it. But it, yeah, I think it always just comes down to taste, you know, and finding the greats and listening to what they do and then coming up with your own voice. What about when you're on the the Barimbo or the Vibes? What do you look for for your drummer to kind of get you going? The main thing I like about the the drummer is I want that fire, like yeah. just that energy. Mm. And um, being a percussionist, that's the thing is I've got to play with so many great drummers. You just listed them, a, a lot of them, and you know. Every drummer's got a heartbeat and a, and a pulse, and the way they play is, you know, whether you know, like playing with Kenny Wollison, or I did one gig with Harold and Riley. I mean, the list just goes on and on. I mean, um, but I say for me, the main thing I like is dynamics and interesting phrasing that makes me play something that I've never played before. And like playing with Vinny on my solos, I was just like, oh, wow, this guy's got such depth. And this is effortless. And it's really fun. Or like when you play with Johnny V, like the way he swings, he's like that old school still. And he's that bridge between, you know, because he came up listening to Tony Williams and Art Blakey like that. You know, he didn't come up listening to hip hop. So his phrasing is going to, even if he plays rock and roll, it's going to be more like 50s rock and roll. It's going to have that swing, that New Orleans mambo thing with it. And that's going to make you play a different way. So, um, yeah, you know, or, or it, it, it's hard to say. There's just so many great drummers out there. And, and I, I think the main thing I like is just when they listen and, and and they're subtle and yet they can be explosive and give you that power. That's what Nikki does. She's got it all. And um, and as a, as a drummer percussionist myself, because I play drum set too, it's just an inexplicable bond in the, the drummer community and the musician community. In a whole, you know, it's like a lot of us were watching that Monday night football game this past week and seeing that 
that young man go down and collapse and go into cardiac arrest and the way it's affected all these players past and present it's the same way with us i mean like there's a certain competitive nature between musicians but the older you get you realize like it's not so much that music school thing of trying to push each other and out play one another as it is to elevate one another and to make each other uh see things and, and and when you're around great musicians, that inspires you to have fun because the music business is designed to suck the fun out of it. And that was something <laughs> Denny said backstage in a really cool way. It was like, wow, this is so much fun playing with you guys. Like, you are great players, and this is really inspiring, and it makes the gig fun. So um, – to me, that's what I look for now is guys that just aren't in their head and are not trying to be too mental. I, I, I mean, I don't even really know that anymore, but they're, they're just people that are listening to one another and, and it's all about music and making music and, and, and having fun on the gig. Mm. Right Feeling on, well. Good. It wouldn't be a podcast about gear if we didn't talk about gear. So what is your yeah. current live rig? My current live rig is I have a majestic vibraphone, much like this one. Mm -hmm. My one in the van has a pickup system. I can show you the what the pickup system looks like on these. I got an X one right here. This is the K&K &K pickup. Okay. This one has a loose wire. It's got to be soldered but it goes underneath the vibes like this. And each bar has a ceramic piezo pickup that goes into that little eighth inch adapter. Oh, this is what cool. the inside of it looks like. So wow. each bar has a pickup. So it's just like a guitar playing over a pickup, a guitar string, but every vibraphone bar has a pickup and it goes into a pedal board. I have a couple over here. Like this is the one I, took out to the um, the small one with a couple of other ones that I took out to the bastard jazz thing we just did then I got um, we take a marimba on tour we usually take this old Deegan this little guy right here out with us mm -hmm. or I have a bigger majestic marimba that I take out and then I have this prophet six that I trigger with my Malacat for synth cool. sounds. So I'm using that, the vibraphone, and I don't have my Timbali set up. I have this old cocktail kit set up right now, but I have Timbali's there, Gunbop Timbali's, and then my Gunbop Bongos, and a Rototom, and my Hand Sonic. So it's a lot of shit to set up for the it <laughs> And I take my tabla with me that y'all have already seen. The How do you amplify those? Just the microphone? What's that? How do you amplify the tabla? With mics? With mics, yeah. And really, it only works good when the band is playing quiet. Mm -hmm. Because if you're playing super loud, it, I mean, it will pick them up. But you got to have a really good sound person. We don't tour with the front of the house right now. Mm. But, do, you, uh, do you take an amp with you or do you use backline? No, I take an amp. Sometimes I take out this Fender Super Reverb or I have a um, I have a Roland a little smaller that's solid state, jazz course that really works good. And then we'll talk about Nikki's drums because I'm really proud of this kit. She just got me some new uh, but I got this old 60s Gretsch Brown bag that, that lives in my car that I my buddy found in the trash in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. What? <laughs> yeah, it's a 60 Stanton verified it. He took it apart. It's a 60s Gretsch, you know, 20, 14, 12. So that's what Nikki plays. And she's got her symbols. Uh, I think she's a Zildjian person. Um yeah. And then that's we got a, a Fender Fender Rhodes. So yeah, that's a big part of my job is loading gear, 
And it keeps, that's the other part. You load gear, you stay strong. <laughs> you got a drum tech, you're not loading gear. I love my drum techs whenever I can have them. But I even will be like, all right, well, let me help you all load gear. You know, but, uh, yeah, you got to okay. love it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, man, that is it. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you've got a, a busy week here getting the tour kicked off. So really appreciate it. Yeah, said, Mike, great talking to you. I'll be will you be able to come to the show? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Thunderbird Music Hall in, in Pittsburgh. I'll be there. Yeah. Um have you seen these things that that um Don Bop sell them, but they're made by Peter Engelhart? No. I mean I've seen pictures, but what does it do? They're pretty cool sounding. I got a couple of these that I bring out with me. Oh, weird. Cool. Um, I like those guys. But yeah, thanks for talking to me. Let me open my mouth. And uh, thanks for having <laughs> the podcast. I drank a lot of espresso. Before. I got to get on your morning routine here. <laughs> <Let me start. laughs> That's the other part of the routine is drink espresso. <laughs> All right. Now it's time for another great lesson from my friend Thomas Went. This time, this is from our Jazz Drum and Essential series. This time he is covering how to play in 3-4 time, which is also known as the waltz. everybody, Thomas Went back with you, continuing our ongoing series on some of just the basic fundamentals of jazz drumming for Drum Factory Direct. Thank you so much for being with us yet again today. Today, we are going to be talking about some of the basics of playing swinging time in 3-4 time. Up until now, we've been dealing uh, all with 4-4 time, but today we're going to talk about playing in 3-4 time. Now, today in jazz, there are all manner of time signatures that are used. But when it comes to odd time signatures, 3-4 is really the place to start. It's the most common odd time signature that you're probably going to be playing in. So, what we're going to talk about first is we'll start with the feet and we will move up. So, let's start with the bass drum. Now, playing in 3-4 time... If the bass player that you're working with is playing a walking bass line, three to the bar, you just feather the bass drum nice and lightly, just like we were talking about in 4-4 four, four time a few lessons back. Now, if the bassist is playing not in, in a walking manner, playing in one, as we say, when we're talking about uh, playing in 3-4 time, you sort of play in one with the bass drum as well, playing a light downbeat on one of each measure, and you can also use different syncopations to kind of kick the groove along as you go. More on that in a few minutes. The hi-hat, we have several different variations that we can use. I'm gonna give you three of the most common. The first is when you play the hi-hat just on beat two, then playing the hi-hat on beats two and three, and finally playing the hi-hat on the and of one and on the downbeat of beat three. So playing quarter notes on the ride cymbal for now, I'm gonna demonstrate all three of those variations back to back. Check this out. Okay, I hope you could see and hear what I was doing and how it relates to the ride cymbal with the hi-hat. So, moving now over to the ride cymbal, we're basically going to be playing what we play in 4-4 four, four time, but we're just going to be sort of fashioning our ride cymbal beat to the 3-4 time signature. So, in 4-4, four, four, when we play day, 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 
we're basically going to take that whole concept and just sort of fit it in to three beats per measure instead of four. Now, there are a lot of different variations that you can use on the cymbal, but again, like with the hi-hat, I'm going to give you three of the most common and probably the most simple that you can start off working on. The first is where you play one, two, three, a one, two, three, a one. The second one would be one, two, a three, one, two, a three. And the, and the third will be one, a two, three, one, a two, three. So I'll play those in succession for you now with a hi-hat on beats two and three. Check this out. All right, I hope you could see and hear what was happening with the cymbal just then. So now we're gonna sort of put all of this together and I'm gonna play a little bit for you where I'm just gonna be mixing all three ride cymbal variations with all three hi-hat variations. And with the bass drum, I'm gonna be sort of playing what we say in one. In other words, if the bass player is not walking, if they're just sort of playing in one, you're doing the same thing with the bass drum, playing a very light downbeat, and then you can also add syncopations to sort of help move the groove along. This is sort of that, that, that nice dance that you get happening with the bass player. Um, that really happens a lot in three, four times. So check this out, mixing sort of everything together. One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, I hope you were able to sort of see how all of this fits together. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot more that can happen when you play in 3/4 time, but this stuff will get you started. This will sort of get you in the ballpark of where you need to be in terms of feel and in terms of coordination. This is a good place to start, but there's a lot of different places you can go when you're playing this music in 3/4 time. Now, as always, I encourage you to listen to all of the masters on record playing in 3-4 time. Check out records like Max Roach's Jazz in 3-4 time from 1956-1957 on the MRC label. You can also listen to the great Jimmy Cobb playing on Miles Davis's Kind of Blue on the track All Blues from 1959. You can also hear Jimmy Cobb playing a beautiful 3-4 time on Miles Davis's Someday My Prince Will Come album on Columbia from, I believe, 1961. Check those out and go from there. I hope this has been helpful, and I look forward to seeing you next time. As always, stay safe and stay close to the music. Look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. All right, let's go check out some vintage drums over at Hawthorne Drum Shop. This time we have what may possibly be a one of a kind. This is a Slingerland kit with all aluminum shells. This is a <laughs> Remo drum set. This is a Ludwig head on here. Yeah, that's, that's actually a, uh, oh, what are that, those called? Looks like Kevlar. Yeah, I can't, you know, I, can't, I swear, the older I get, I can't remember the, the names of those heads, but. This is a Slingerland kit, and I'm actually really excited to talk about this one <clears throat> because this is a really cool find. Yeah, you gotta tell me what's going on here. I don't even know what I'm looking at. So I'll give you some quick background. So there's some drums that came up locally, kind of like a couple kits, some snares, cymbals, whatever. 
And went over to take a look at them. It was in a basement. This is part of the lot. And, um, you know, obviously they're gold. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, nice rewrap. You know, there's no badges anywhere. I figured they probably rewrapped over the badge on the bass drum. The Toms wouldn't have had badges for this era. So I get in my car, you know, bring it back here the next day, and one of the bass drum hoops was broken. So I decided to take the, the, the hoop off, so I glue it up, and open it up, and it's gold on the inside, which was my first thing. Well, they painted the inside, too. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that there's, like, it's not wood. <laughs> it's metal. And it like, my next thing is like, well, somebody made a metal drum kit. Yeah. And then so I took the heads off the two toms and they're metal too. And like, I started looking over the kit. I'm like, this is done like really well. Like all period correct hardware, like no mist drills, all the like the interior screws are correct. And so like, I'm kind of like freaking out. Like, it sounds amazing. I'm like, mm-hmm. this is a really, someone to build this kit. I'm trying to figure it like. Oh, you thought it was like a, like a custom made. Yeah. And the more I thought about it and the more I looked at it, I'm like, I don't think somebody like made these shells and put the hardware on them. If you take the heads off, you can see that there are, alum- and so they're all aluminum, it's aluminum shells. There are brazed aluminum rings, a flat wall, and then on the seam, there's like a, uh, an aluminum bar with welds on it, mm-hmm. which looks exactly like the student snares they made mm-hmm. in the early 60s. Yeah. And even like the finish, not the finish, but like the, the texture of the, yeah. the aluminum is the same as those snares. Yeah. So I think, and this is, I don't know the history behind it, because it's just a kit that was passed along. I think that Slingerland made a, a prototype kit mm. that was all aluminum. Yeah, because this doesn't exist in any documentation I've seen. No, and, and again, like I'm not, I don't have, my gut tells me that that's what it is, because mm-hmm. it makes the most sense. Um, How'd you know it was aluminum? You can see the actual aluminum like on the inside, because there's like a couple paint chips and you can just like the rings, and so it looks exactly the same as the student snares. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the weird things, I think this probably is like an early 60s, pretty early kit. And I think it probably had clamp-on bass drum spurs, because these are actually backwards. These, oh, right, yeah. And when we took them off, I'm like, well maybe they put them on backwards, but the holes didn't, full spacing didn't match up on both sides, and you can see that the like, the holes kind of are like gnarled a little bit. So I think somebody put these on, of course, backwards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the assumption is you should be able to reach the thumb screw, right? That's the assumption. Well, not even that, but like if it's a left-handed kit, the spurs would be on the, the front of the drum. You know what I mean? Because they're facing, the spurs are actually facing backwards if you're behind the oh, kit. Yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, that is weird. Yeah, it's, it, it sounds so good. This is really wild. We didn't, we didn't change any of that. We changed the, the batter hoop on the bass drum just so we could kind of play it, but it sounds like way too good. Is that a different tom arm than other drums from that era? It looks um, a little bit better than what I remember. No, they, they did like this, uh, what do you call it, like a clock style? That's what some people call it with the long spade arm. Mm-hmm. This will smash the tone of any drum. Oh yeah, I can't stand them. It's crazy, like you'll tap on the go ding, nice, and then you boop. Yep. <laughs> so it looks cool, uh, but it's not like super functional and it kind of ruins the tone of drums. Yeah. And then they went to like the L arm style and all that. And Are there any vents on any of these drums? No. I wonder why they didn't think to do that. Uh, I mean, it was caught, like Tom's back then didn't have vents. Mm. Bass drum would have like a badge up here. So that's what I figured they just like wrapped over the badge. And if you like look at the seam, I'll just show you, you probably can't see it on there. But you see the little piece of aluminum sticking through? The seam doesn't really look, and granted it was a dark basement, but the seam doesn't look like it would, it kind of just looks like a wrap, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what that is, but brass hoops, probably an original Weather King head there. Um, got some heft to it, but like you can't even like look inside to see what's going on. Here, you know? <laughs> what a mystery. Was anyone else making metal drums in this time period? <clears throat> um, Jeremy from Q has a, a metal snare drum with rivets on it from the late 1800s, he told me. <laughs> really? But no, I don't, don't think that there, were any, there weren't any kits that were being made at the time. That's wild. Wonder why they, I mean, let's just assume this was the prototype wonder why not 
going through and making them? It might have been too costly. Um, and it's kind of, it's interesting. So I'm thinking about like the machinery. That's a 15 by 12 mm. depth. This is a 12 or 20 by 12. I wonder if like 12 was the deepest that they had the ability to make. Oh. So Vakun, who does Oriolo, he, which is different, it's a sponge shell. When he first started, he could only make a drum that was, I think, 12 inches deep. Granted, that's a different process, but I'm wondering if the machining only allowed them to make a limited. And it might have just been too expensive. Mm. You know what I mean? But, yeah, this kit is not for sale. <laughs> it's super cool. Yeah, it, I, it's... You have to come to Hawthorne to check it out. <laughs> that's that's the, the caveat. A lot of people walk by this. We just kind of have it sitting on the floor and just kind of walk it by it. It just looks like a gold wrap. Yeah. Which I thought was cool enough. I'm like, oh, this is going to be really cool. You know, and it's got 12 depth. It's like my favorite size bass drum. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be really cool. And when I found out it was a 15, I'm like, that's great, because I don't really like 14s. And 15 is like a nice middle of the ground between a 14 and a 16. Oh. Obviously, because it's the number between 14. <laughs> it's like Josh Freeze told me. I like 21 inch ride cymbals, because it's not a 20 and it's not a 22. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Were there, were there a lot of 15s in this? I know marching drums were 15s. Yeah, so but... Sunderland made, um, it's called a stage band kit. It's similar to club, club date style. It had single lugs. And I think we've talked about those, how back in the day when they were just making like, there wasn't like a low, lower end shell, they would cost, cost cut by using less hardware. Mm -hmm. So you could get like a three ply shell with center lugs on the base, the rack, and the floor tom, and it would, cost the company less to make because there's less hardware. So yeah. that's kind of how they sold it as like a cheaper alternative. But anyway, their stage band kits would come in a 15 sometimes. Oh, I've never seen those. That's Ludwig cool. II would do a, a club date that was a 22, 13, 15. Really? That's yeah, I, I think mostly in the early 60s. Mm. WFL, you'll see them a lot of, a lot of 15s. That's weird. I guess they were making so many marching drums. Maybe that's why. I don't know. I mean, it's a good size. You ever play a 15? I have a few. I like them, but it's just not... I don't see them on old drums very often. And then Wahlberg and Auger used to make a, f I don't think they did any 15s, but they would do like a 14 diameter by 16. What? And I have a premiere kit in the back. <laughs> we'll have to do that one. It's, it's a 16 diameter by 18. What? Yeah. That's weird. I'm sure it doesn't sound good. <laughs> Some ideas are better off just... That's all about what's it look like on stage, you know? <laughs> how, how big can you make it look? This is a cool kit. What would you call it? I mean, prototype. So anybody who asks me, I call it a prototype. Again, I, it's, I don't know. I'm just, this is like the best of my knowledge. If you have any, if anybody has a kit like this or knows any history, please email me. Um, Very curious. I'm interested to know anything about it, but. That's pretty sick. So yeah. don't be fooled to find something that looks like it's been rewrapped. It might be metal. Yeah, so I think from now on, when I go to buy drums, I'm just gonna like start yeah. knocking on them. <laughs> Because if I would have knocked, you can hear them, you know, you can hear the metal. I forgot to mention in the past few episodes that if you have any questions you would like us to answer, or me or one of our guests, um, I can send it out to anyone that has been on the show before, um, send them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. Um, I love hearing back from you, the things that you want us to s discuss or questions you may have about your gear or playing or teaching or the industry or whatever. Uh, again, shoot over your questions to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. Okay, it's time for the warehouse pick of the week. And we just, um, oh, here's one right here. Give me one second. We have a whole slew of these house brand drum heads. These are um, DFD. We're calling these vintage white. We have them in all range of sizes, I think from six to probably 28 or something like that. These are single ply, 10 mil. Um, they're, they're not smooth white, they're kind of opaque white drum heads. If you have any vintage drums with the original bass drum heads or whatever, like the original Ludwig front heads and Slingerland front heads, these are darn near identical to that. I just I just replaced the heads on my Slingerland Bebop kit with these and my Ludwig um, um, downbeat kit with these. And when I took the original heads off, they are pretty much identical. Just the way that the, the 
You can sort of see through it. It just has that old vintage white appearance, and it's just a good quality single ply head. The prices are really ridiculous. So if you have an old vintage drum that you want to replace the front head on your bass drum, um, I mean, you, can, you can get a Ludwig sticker or whatever and put on it. It's going to look exactly like the original that came with it if your kit came with plastic heads and not capskin heads, obviously. But yeah, go check these out now. They are called DFD Vintage White Drum Heads. And that is it for this week's episode. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you give us a review over on iTunes or Spotify or drop some comments on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you are interested in, in a Drum Candy Podcast t-shirt, we still have a batch of those. They are in the maroon, this sort of color um, with the full color logo on them. Super comfortable. They're kind of like pre-aged, pre-washed. Um, yeah, you can, again, you can, you can hit us up. You can just go to the website. You can find them there. Or if you want to just let us know, um, you know, hit the hit the Drum Candy Podcast Gmail. You know, I want a T-shirt, and we'll hook you up. You can pay through the site, or we could possibly do like a Venmo thing and ship it out to you. So, um, get one of those. And yeah, that's it. We'll see you next time. <laughs>